Okay, everybody, welcome to our final Bayer webinar of the uh, academic year. Um, and I'm really delighted to present the first cohort of fellows that rotated um, through our industry um, rotation. And they are each going to give you a little um, sort of synopsis of what they um, took away from the rotation and a little bit about themselves. And then they are going to entertain some Q and A's about the rotation. Um, I have to say that this group was stellar. Um, really, really enjoyed having all of them. Um, all of our top scientists at Bayer that spent time with them really, really um, thought that um, this was a great group of fellows. And so um, we learned from you and I hope you learned a lot from us. And why don't we take it in the order that you guys came. So let's start with Powell. You're on mute. All right. Yep. There we go. It's only been two years since the pandemic started, but um, hello, everybody. Um, nice. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll go ahead and just share a little a slide here. Um, so I'm Powell. I'm one of the second year fellows at UMass uh, Chan Medical School. Um, I also am an emergency medicine physician here um, working during my fellowship. Um, I trained in my residency in emergency medicine also here at UMass. I um, went to medical school out in the Midwest at Central Michigan University, um, and I'm originally from Cambridge, Mass., so Massachusetts native. Um, in terms of um, how I ended up um, doing this, this program, this fellowship that was set up, um, I was really looking to get some kind of exposure to um, toxicology in industry, and aptly named, um, this drew my attention. So. Um, I think that, you know, where most of us are poison control center based or academic center based, and while we have some connections to folks that have gone into industry, it's unlikely that outside of consulting that most of our attendings, at least here, um, for me and the attendings that I've met, uh, most toxicologists don't do, you know, really any work outside of um, clinical toxicology or research. Um, and so I wanted to kind of step outside of my circle here and get exposed to some other toxicologists and see what toxicology looked like in industry. Um, in particular, it was exciting to me that there was um, an emphasis on um, topics we don't get a lot of training in, um, both during fellowship or during um, our preclinical time in medical school. Um, so specifically related to, um, in this case, um, farming and agriculture. Um, and looking at pesticides and herbicides and the regulatory process that goes into kind of evaluating those chemicals and their safety. Um, so that was something I was excited about and did ultimately learn a lot about. Um, and it was nice to learn more about regulatory science in areas outside of pharmaceuticals, um, like over the counters and um, devices as well. So all very, very helpful. Um, in terms of things that I really felt like I got out of the rotation, um, like I said, I think I learned a lot about the regulatory science kind of goes into each each major category of product, whether it's pharmaceutical or crop protection products. Um, it was also wonderful to meet a really broad range of scientists with a lot of different backgrounds who were clearly very passionate about what they do um, and the work um, that they, they are uh, participating in, um, both primary science researchers as well as those um, leading regulatory science divisions. Um, and um, I, like I said, knew nothing about the regulatory process for crop protection products. So learning about pesticides and other crop protection products was really informative and helpful. Um, so hopefully I'm gonna take um, a couple things with me um, and pass them on to some of my colleagues and future learners. I'm sticking around um, UMass next year as a faculty member starting at the end of the summer. Um, and I'm gonna be doing mostly clinical toxicology work and taking over our outpatient clinic later in the year. Um, and I'm hoping to put together a couple uh, lectures on um, regulatory toxicology or regulatory science, especially focusing on pesticides. So you don't get a lot of exposure. I already put together my first lecture, which I gave about a month ago um, about my time on this rotation and also um, a little bit um, about regulatory science around crops. Thank you. Thank you, Pal. Thank you, Pal. Um, Sonia, you are the next fellow that started. Why don't you go ahead and present your slide? Sure. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All right. 
Hi guys, I am uh, Sonia Rashid. I am a junior fellow at Toxicon Consortium in Chicago, Illinois, soon to be a senior fellow in about two weeks. Um, I'm originally from the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Um, I did my emergency medicine training at the University of Miami in Jackson, <clears throat> Florida. Um, and so I was really interested in applying to this program because I've always had a very strong interest in regulation and consumer health. And this started in my undergraduate years at the University of South Florida. Um, I took a lot of drug development classes and I actually wanted to get a PhD in drug development and organic chemistry. But when I started working in the lab and actually working with the chemicals, I realized I wasn't really much of a lab person, but I still really appreciated the biochemistry and the pharmacokinetics that went into uh, drug development. So um, this led to a very strong interest in industry. So during the beginning stages of my fellowship, I started giving lectures on um, contamination and safety of consumer products and especially cosmetics. So I learned a lot about um, <clears throat> contamination and cosmetics with heavy metals, you know, for instance, uh, coal eyeliners used in the Middle East, they're often contaminated with lead. I learned a lot about, you know, possible endocrine disruptors. I gave a lecture about parabens, phthalates. And so when I saw this opportunity arise, I realized I really wanted to take what I was learning in my medical toxicology fellowship and really see how I can use it in the field of regulatory toxicology. <clears throat> All right, let's see. We're going to work. Sorry. Okay. So um, I learned so many things from this rotation. Um, here are some of my major takeaways that I'm going to go through here um, with the consumer healthcare, regulatory toxicology, vitamin, cosmetics, regulation, drug development. Um, I found so many things very interesting. And so kind of the first part of the rotation, we went through uh, pesticides, herbicides, glyphosate, bears role in all of that. And to be completely honest with you, I really did not know anything about um, pesticides, herbicides, or glyphosates, or GMOs. And so it was very eye-opening to see all of the kind of propaganda and you know faulty journal articles and kind of negative media surrounding um, these types of compounds. And I really realized that you know the kind of negative attention GMOs get are just completely false. You know um, what I learned about GMOs, it's often used to target against, you know, problematic insects, fungi, bacteria, really to protect the crops so we can feed, you know, the 7.8 billion people on the planet along with um, Roundup and, you know, everything that Bayer is doing with that. So that was fascinating to learn about. And it was also great because we got tours of different farms and um, I learned a lot about digital farming and finding, you know, the best places to, you know, plant crops and get the highest yield um, so that way we can provide more to the consumers. We also did a lot of virtual tours. Um, we did one in Arizona where I got to see the um, Bayer factory along with the virtual tour in Brazil, which was completely fascinating. Um, we also learned a lot about um, other different fields. Um, we did a little bit about phytomedicine. I learned a lot about different plant-derived products. For instance, Urbagast, which is used in functional dyspepsia and IBS, is derived from plants. Um, however, the part I think I found the most interesting just from my background um, in undergrad was definitely the consumer health care and the regulatory toxicology part. I found it fascinating um, how a, uh, a prescription drug can go to becoming over the counter and all of the steps that toxicologists are involved in making sure that it's safe. I really found it fascinating looking at excipients from you know, over-the-counter drug products and seeing if they are, you know, safe for consumers. Like, are they carcinogenic? Are they environmentally friendly? Um, you know, we talked a lot about, um, yeah, the parabens, phthalates, microplastics in like facial scrub products and how they can affect the environment. Um, I really found fascinating the regulatory part of the rotation, like going into how vitamins are regulated and how there's really not this pre-approval process with the FDA and that it's regulated more similarly to food than it is to drugs. And then we went into cosmetics, really the thing that really, you know, interests me very greatly. And, you know, looking at the different cosmetic regulations in uh, different countries, for instance, the EU has a much more like robust um, process of making sure that cosmetics are safer for consumers. They require a safety dossier, which is not 
required in the United States. And it's interesting to see that other countries are starting to implement that when putting cosmetics out into the market. Um, and the next part I found really interesting was looking really at the bench to bedside process of developing a drug. Um, we looked at the development of Zeralto and how you know long it took to develop that drug. And you know, on average, it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a drug and about $2.6 billion to really bring it forth. Um, and then we also saw some really interesting documentaries as well. Um, we saw Food Evolution and then Shot in the Arm. Shot in the Arm to me was very fascinating. I hope everyone gets a chance to see it once it's out. But really, it kind of is going, talks a lot about that propaganda and the false information regarding vaccines and how it can be really detrimental to, you know, the world and the population at whole. So how I plan on like taking this information and bringing it forward. I have a very strong interest in doing pharmaceuticals. I really want to develop safer products for consumers, especially, you know, health products, um, cosmetics, you know, over the counter products. And I'm hoping to establish a career in the field. Um, it's really exciting. I've talked to some of the people from Johnson and Johnson. And um, hopefully I can go ahead and, you know, do an internship with them or you know, work on some research projects. So I'm just really excited to take my medical toxicology training that I'm receiving right now from Toxicon and bring it forward and, you know, into the world of pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Well, that's a great, great synopsis. Sasha, you're up. Hi everybody, I'm Sasha Kaiser. I'm one of the medical toxicology fellows out of Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Safety, and I'll be graduating in two weeks and moving on um, where I'll take a role at the Washington State Poison Center. Um, I have worn a lot of hats in my life. I was started out as a pharmacy technician, uh, worked as a nurse for a while, and then went to medical school to ultimately go to emergency medicine and then do uh, medical toxicology. So along this way, um, I guess you could say I like to shop around before I figure out what I want to do. Um, but I, especially because of the pandemic, I didn't have a great sense of what toxicology looked like outside of our local field. Um, and here we have the poison center, we have our inpatient medicine, we also have a really healthy legal consulting group with some of our attendees, but I really didn't know what else being a toxicologist could look like. Um, and so I think one of the things that we miss out with with the pandemic is you don't have the opportunities to interact with people outside of your group as much. And so I didn't really get a chance to try and figure out what that looked like. And so when this opportunity became available, I thought it'd be a great chance to continue to see what other options are open uh, from, for toxicology. And so that's exactly what I got. Um, I got the exposure to pesticides, to the drug regulatory process, um, the exposure to the different ways that we manage um, different regulations, uh, as we mentioned with the cosmetics, the vitamins, um, and then too with the prescription drugs, like how much testing has to go into this. And so um, I think it really gives you a broad overview of things that just we don't talk about in our toxicology fellowships and gives you a better sense of kind of how behind the scenes things work. Um, with through this, I had the opportunity to give a lecture on over the counter drug regulation, which I just found extremely fascinating um, how much of this is historically based, what actually happens once you kind of go through this process and how much regulation is really required and how that changes from one type of over-the-counter drug to another type and how um, and how that changes too with your prescription drugs. And so that's the part that I really found fascinating. Um, all of it was great. I um, am a big Evernote user and I had over 60 entries by the time that I was done. Um, and so I'm glad that my, I'm not writing this because my hand would be extremely cramped, but I just, uh, it was just so much information about things that I didn't even know that I didn't know. Um, and so I think while you can come into this and you have a focused interest or you have something that you really want to know more about, mine was more of a what does life look like outside of the hospital? Um, and how can I use my career in ways that are a little bit more non-traditional? And so I, I highly recommend this um, for even if you decide that you are not interested in going out into industry, just to get a better sense of what other things that we are a part of without even realizing it. 
And last but not least, Ari. Sure. So uh, uh, just standard disclosure slide, I, I didn't directly receive any money to, to say any of this. Um, I think the Medical Toxicology Foundation um, subsidized my department for it, but uh, not, not paid to say any of these things. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a second year uh, fellow over at WashU here in St. Louis. Um, I uh, was very interested uh, in, in doing this rotation, mostly from my uh, anticipated job. Um, so next year I'll be working for the Arkansas Poison Center. And uh, one of the things that I was looking for is, you know, so much of our job is based on the nuts and bolts of bedside medical toxicology. And one of the things that I thought was interesting was, um, you know, how, you know, in, in industry, we assess the risk of toxicity, not just to people, but populations, you know, I, what, not what happens with, with what we're used to, which is, say, one person taking a large amount of some active ingredient, but uh, what happens if, you know, large numbers of people are exposed to normal amounts of this stuff? What happens at a population level? And, you know, what are potential risks of toxicity? And then I was interested, you know, how do you communicate these risks? And these might be risks to individuals, you know, we, I am, we are interested in starting up a bedside toxicology service, and so being able to communicate on an individual basis is, was helpful, but um, might be uh, being able to communicate about risks, you know, talking to legislators, people who are trying to lobby to get certain things on the controlled substance list, or convince a P&T committee that a product you want to put on the formulary, formulary has had a uh, rigorous safety evaluation, or that the benefit of using it outweighs the risk. Um, one thing that was of particular interest to me was that uh, Arkansas is a fairly rural state and um, exposure to pesticides and other crop protection agents is a real concern. And so um, I wanted to be able to communicate to patients about the risks of, of any potential risk of these uh, agents or, and uh, their safety evaluations. And then uh, lastly, uh, interesting to kind of peculiarity about my position is that I'll actually be working through the College of Pharmacy, um, and so about half of my time is going to be dedicated to education of pharmacy students, residents, um, and those within the, the pharmacy program. And I realize that despite the fact that we prescribe drugs and that um, we, you know, will go ahead and, um, you know, opine about them on a regular basis, I knew very, very little about how drugs are brought to market, how they're evaluated for safety, what's the regulatory framework in place. Um, you know, I knew very little about the pharmaceutical products in, uh, in general. And so what I ended up taking away from the rotation, um, first, I, I thought it was great to actually learn about how we evaluate products for, for toxicity and safety. Um, I was fairly curious on how you do this for certain things because for pesticides, for example, we don't, you know, we don't uh, dose people with them. We don't check to see what's the low L, when do they get sick. Uh, we use animals and things like uncertainty factors and thought that was very interesting to, to learn about. These aren't, um, we don't do trials for things like that. And then also learned about um, aspects of safety evaluations that are not necessarily even intrinsic to the active ingredient of the of the um, medication or pesticide itself. So things like applicators that they design or packaging of medications or even assessing the clarity of instructions from the standpoint of you know, an average person's healthcare literacy. And then it was really interesting to learn about who actually evaluates these products, the role of the EPA and FDA, how other organizations like IARC or the WHO or USDA might weigh in. And, um, and how these different groups of, you know, consumer or agricultural or pharmaceutical products might be evaluated. And uh, lastly, it was pretty neat to see what, what the basic science framework is to how that's set up to look for potential toxicity. And so I'm kind of used to, uh, you know, being our fellowship in medical toxicology, thinking that, you know, medical toxicologists are the center of the universe. But a lot of this data is driven by PhD toxicology, which or PhD toxicologists, and I didn't realize a lot about a lot of the basic science that goes into this and how to medical toxicologists can help translate this more into a, um, a clinical environment and, and coordinate teams that are looking at these highly focused, um, you know, practical research questions. And then the last thing I'll say about the, the program in terms of the, you know, the quality of the program and the lectures, um, these are lectures that were given by subject matter experts in their field. 
Um, some of them might not have actually been toxicologists, but you know, or basic scientists, but people like sociologists and regulatory specialists who gave some very interesting perspective on all this. Lectures from all over, not just here in the Chesterfield and St. Louis area, but other places within the U.S., like a virtual tour of site in Arizona, places abroad like you know, France, U.K., Germany, Brazil. And so it was very neat to get this focused one-on-one -on -one instruction and to have the availability of these um, uh, subject matter experts to, to, um, uh, for their questions. And so some general notes uh, that I have about it was that um, you know, several of the, the early lectures were very basic science focused and it was kind of refreshing to be taken back to that, um, added some, uh, uh, some perspective and um, the, the material was honestly uh, t challenging at times so it's pretty important to stay focused. But ultimately a really great opportunity to have some sort of connection to people in industry and you may realize that there are things that you feel very passionately about that might fall outside of the purview of academic toxicology. Um, you know, for example, uh, Dr. Dunn and I just recently submitted a letter to the editor to The Economist magazine about, you know, upcoming food, uh, food crises and um, unscientific measures against, against GMO crops and pesticides. So ultimately, very enriching opportunity and um, might have um, opened doors to interesting areas that you may not have initially thought about. So we can now open up for questions. If anybody's got questions and they want to either go off mute, I don't know, Dia, if they can, or um, or put them in the chat. One question that I have for you all is what was the most surprising thing you took away from the course? Anyone jump in? I'm, I'm a little sad to say, but kind of like what Ari touched on is that I I also was was sort of with the medical toxicologist in the center of the universe. I had kind of forgotten how many other kinds of toxicologists with very different backgrounds there are. So meeting so many other toxicologists with different experiences um, was really great and kind of a, a pleasant surprise during the rotation. You're on mute. Uh, I I think also too, there was almost surprises every day <laughs> that things that I probably should have known and didn't know or that you had forgotten or, um, you know, even some of the aspects of like the GMO stuff and how toxicologists uh, can have a role in that. I just didn't even think about that. Um, and so I feel like by having all of these different perspectives, it gives you a different question or a different view on things than I would have had otherwise. And so I, I, I felt like every lecture we had, I had another aha moment, um, which uh, I didn't expect to have. I, you know, I, as you go through this, especially in your second year, you've read Gold Franks so many times and you're like, there's, I know I'm going to be surprised. There's always the minutia, but to be constantly surprised with each lecture was not what I was anticipating. Yeah, yeah. Doing the rotation with Sasha was awesome because we got to like um, kind of go back and forth about like the different things that we found really surprising and, um, you know, really just seeing the real world um, application of what we're learning in fellowship and how we can apply it to like a grander scale with our training, I think was the thing that I didn't realize was out there for my particular interests and, you know, the potential for the growth um, that different fields of you know regulation can have. So definitely was such a wonderful experience meeting so many intelligent people that are such masters of their own fields and you know them just being so happy to share with us all of their knowledge. And it was so much to take in. I have so many notes from all of this. And even my presentation just wasn't enough to just talk about, you know, just everything that I learned and just how surprised I was in a very good way and how hopeful I am for, you know, different careers that are potentially could evolve from, you know, our training as medical toxicologists. Can I also put in one more thing that I thought was important before Ari? I just also to, um, I expected a very biased version of everything. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised how, um, how unbiased a lot of this information was. Uh, that was a huge thing that I was like, okay, there's going to be a certain tilt on all of this information. And really you had the information in a very intelligent way, but you didn't have that push towards, you have to believe this one thing. 
which I thought being industry, you're going to have this push on it. it. That was a great surprise to not have that. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. One of the things that I thought was really interesting and very surprising from the, from the very beginning was uh, I feel like in addition to having such like a bedside clinical med talks uh, bias. We also have a lot of a North America bias, and so Bayer being like a big global corporation, thinking about the the challenges of not just you know what sort of, what's the regulatory burden here, but where is it all over the world, and um, how are different medications uh, or different products used all over the world? You know the the higher use or prevalence of herbal preparations in in Germany and the EU certain regulatory measures or opinions in different um, different parts of the world that kind of affect um, affect things. And even what's the, you know, approach to regulatory toxicology in the world, in, you know, in the rest of the world versus the U.S., you know, is it a, a risk-based system? Is it a hazard-based system? And these are things that, like, never cross my mind but really factor into uh, seems to be the decision of, you know, um, how things are, are evaluated and, and brought to market. There's a question in the chat that, let me pull it up just one second. <clears throat> so here we go, let's see. Um, any advice uh, for future candidates on the best way to prepare, prepare yourself for the rotation? I actually am, I don't think you need to prepare yourself. I think you just need to be open. And I think, you know, the best part about this is not being ready for the lecture to begin with, but the research that you do after the lecture is over, because it opens up so many more questions. And so I felt like my prep work was not in the front part of it. My prep work was after all the discussions had been happened, and then I go and look things up, and it leads to more questions that we talk about the next day as well, too. So I, I don't think you need to prep yourself. I think you just need to be open and be ready for the experience and, and open to learning more about things that you think you know a lot about and you maybe don't know as much as you thought, you know. <laughs> I absolutely second that. I think that um, lectures either sort of stood on their own or progressed logically such that like you were building your knowledge and there's a certain amount of space repetition as well so that certain concepts that are relevant you know, across different types of regulatory science or different regulatory markets um, kind of continue to come back. And so you start to see themes and stuff like that. So I don't, I agree. No, no prep work really, really needed, just willing to be engaged and participate. I think like during the rotation, definitely just like taking notes on the lectures so that way you can develop those questions just because you're having the presenter who is a master in their field and you can just ask them in real time, what does this mean? And no question is a stupid question, I've realized, just because really all of this stuff was so brand new. So really just during the rotation, just being very active and involved. Yeah, I agree. And there are a lot of things that would be very difficult to prepare for um, beforehand. And people are very uh, open and aware of that. Like, uh, you know, my first time being, oh, oh yes, yeah, a foliar applicator, of course. Like, uh, I know exactly what that is. But uh, I mean, people expect that you may not. And, uh, um, and they're, of course, uh, willing to answer these questions for you. Yeah, there's really no such thing as a stupid question. And um, yeah, the, we um, found that um, it was great to have people who were open and interested in learning. Um, one of the things that when I was training in toxicology, I, there was a lot of time when you would spend time trying to learn stuff on your own. And reading about regulatory science by itself can be a little bit dry and kind of maybe like watching paint dry. So I think the goal of this was to, to try to um, in, infuse a little bit more sort of um, interesting content in into what is a Noel, what is it, you know, and, and all these variety of different things that you learn um, through a book, um, but bringing sort of the science that backs it up um, it, to life. So we hope that um, we achieve that. And I think so. I think you don't have to read up or anything like that. You have to come with, um, you know, an idea that um, there's, there, there's a whole big, huge world out there that um, you can learn a lot about in a month's time. And so um, I hope that you were able to take that away. 
Um, Ken Cooley, what other opportunities would you suggest fellows or prospective um, fellows pursue if they're interested in starting a career after industry in industry after fellowship? Now, I you guys can I'll let you guys take a stab at that and tell me what you think. I think one of the great things about this rotation is you get put into contact with people that you never would have had interactions with in the first place, and so you can start to create those connections and you can start to network. And a lot of times with a lot of our jobs, it's really about who you know that can kind of get you to that next level. And so um, I think the biggest opportunity is saying yes to a rotation like this, where you can meet people who um, you wouldn't have met otherwise. And this can lead to opportunities that just you wouldn't have even known existed. Yeah, I think just being active and, you know, emailing those people that you found, you know, their lectures very interesting or you have an interest in that field and just seeing what opportunities they have available or just their, you know, like career advice as to how they got to where they got and like steps that you can take in order to establish that career for yourself, I think is probably what I took going, you know, from this rotation. Yeah, I definitely had the impression that most people who, um, you know, uh, were toxicologists and me that uh, transition to industry um, feel pretty passionately and tend to uh, enjoy their jobs. And most of them are, tend to want to be enthusiastic about, um, you know, uh, at least pointing you in the, in the right direction. Um, and it's definitely important to, seems to be to, to make these connections. I kind of doubt that most of the toxicologists in industry wound up there by kind of like applying on some faceless uh, job bank, um, but maybe I'm wrong. I will say having talked to one of our uh, former faculty who now works for a small pharmaceutical company in uh, Cambridge about kind of his path there after now kind of going down to, to minimal part-time in, in emergency medicine, um, that he said that when he was initially looking at those jobs, um, a lot of them were hesitant to take him because he didn't have a background in regulatory science or experience with that, and they wanted him to do that kind of work um, as part of what he was doing there. And so I think that doing a rotation like this or finding another way to get experience with regulatory science um, will give you a leg up with those kinds of opportunities as well. Yeah, I think that's right. And so uh, some of you probably have heard my career trajectory, but it really is involved with networking. Um, and so when I was in emergency medicine and thinking about toxicology um, as a third year resident, um, I was uh, I went to NACT and met Dan Goldstein, who worked at Monsanto at the time, um, and then stayed in touch with him for my career as it developed through my toxicology uh, rotation or through a fellowship. Then as a junior attending, um, when I started building the fellowship in, in St. Louis and then on, you know, through the years. And then before you knew it, 2015, he sends out an email talking about uh, needing, for, needing somebody to um, replace him as he retired and he wanted to hire them to train them over a couple of years. And so it's because I had kept in touch with him and had networked with him that that the opportunity became available for me. And so um, one of, and I hadn't actually had any background in regulatory toxicology at the time. Um, and so I learned on the job through him. He was a real mentor to me um, with that. Um, and a lot of people on the call here have been mentors to me as well. Um, but the, the, really important thing about this is you, if you rotate through this program, you will meet the top scientists at Bayer um, and you will get to pick their brains about how, how everything goes from the bench to the field or the bench to the bedside. Um, and having access to those people um, who are very excited to be able to share their um, in-depth knowledge um, it's, it's, it's really, I think, one of the great things that this, this program offers. And I think you've all, you know, spent time talking to them on, a lot of them on your own, right? You've reached out and you've been able to network with them. Tell us a little tiny bit about that, if, um, if what, if who you've been able to talk to and how that's helped. Um, so I reached out to the Johnson & Johnson, as you know, uh, Dr. Ed Kuffner. I actually just had a meeting with him last week 
over Zoom. And I'm really excited. There's a lot of potential to like work in the field, especially if my interest in like cosmetics and consumer health products. Um, you know, uh, there's a potential for like an internship. There's different research projects that they're working on. So um, some things kind of in the works, um, but definitely a great starting point, I think, for myself as someone who just kind of had this de novo interest in this field and kind of seeing it become something of its own slowly but surely. Um, it's very exciting for me. And um, I wouldn't have had that opportunity without this experience. So I'm very grateful for that. Asha, have you talked to anybody? So I haven't reached out to anybody yet. And I think that part of that's just from the craziness of second year coming yeah. to an end. Yeah but I never felt like there was any doors closed. And instead I felt like this was, um, with this rotation, um, there are some goals for you to do presentations and to do articles after you've finished this to kind of establish yourself in this field. And so I, I feel like there is just opportunities. I have a lot of their email addresses. Um, I have, it almost seems like an open door invitation. Like if you have more questions, if you have interest, just go ahead and reach out to us. And I'm sure that I will, because the goal is to continue to have more of these presentations and to write some papers on some of the things that I learned. Um, and so mine is a little bit delayed, but I, I still anticipate that it will happen. Um, everybody that we, that lectured to us was incredibly generous with their time, incredibly generous with their knowledge, and very excited to share that to clinicians um, and try to translate what they do to the medical aspect of it. Um, and because I think that we're a little bit in a unique position to have the medical providers right in front of you where they can share exactly what they do. Um, so I think this there's going to be continued opportunities in the future for a long time. And if you are interested in this, that's the great part about this is you can continue to extend those opportunities. Yeah, we're happy to partner with you all to help you provide resources for academic work, to provide resources for lectures and things like that. So yeah, look at it as, as an opportunity to sort of build a niche, something that you th thought was fascinating about the rotation and build just some expertise in that niche area, which will then give you a, a trajectory later in the future. I don't know if uh, uh, Ari or Powell have any comments. I haven't talked to anybody other than you, Liza, since then. Um, I'll probably be bothering you after boards in the fall when I start working on a couple more lectures for the for the junior fellows and maybe the residents here, um, as I did for my current lecture that'll go through a couple revisions, I'm sure. Um, so, but I look forward to, to reaching out to folks and it certainly seemed like everybody was, was more than happy to continue to discuss the work that they do. I think that came through with like how passionate everybody seemed about uh, the work that they did. So, which was very refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd not been in touch with uh, other toxicologists from the rotation, but um, I know that we've uh, we've discussed, uh, um, you know, af after this, things like even letters to the editor about things that we've, um, you know, kind of felt are um, central to my own personal interests and, um, you know, and Bayer and then things like, you know, uh, even things like cross-training, uh, you know, a PhD, ABAT pharmacists, um, and so kind of opportunities for some, uh, you know, uh, kind of public-private partnerships. Um, and so we've, I, I certainly, we certainly probably would not have had, I know that I interviewed at WashU 10 years ago, and I think that we chatted then, but we probably would not have made this, uh, this sort of connection had it not been for the rotation. Excellent. What would you say surprised you most about industry? So um, for, I'm going to say since the, since, you know, the mid early 2000s, um, Academics have really kind of distanced themselves about industry and with industry and for understandable reasons. So what would you say is a benefit um, of trying to interact with industry a little bit more? And it's not all about the money. Um, when we when we did this, um, I think the the, the great thing about having a large company that I didn't realize is how much resources you have to 
use this towards the safety of your patient or just to the safety of the consumers. And so when we talked about this, um, a couple of the things that floored me was the amount of education that goes into places that are developing countries as far as their pesticide use and how um, they are actively will put um, students in these roles to help educate the communities um, and to the amount of resources that it takes to get new drugs onto um, available uh, to the public and why having a bigger company can make such a big difference to get those drugs there. Um, I, you know, I you think about it as being such a cold, harsh system that is all about how much money can be made. And then you made the people in the middle of it who are actually doing the work and you realize that they're really passionate about the safety and why they've switched over to the regulatory aspects of it or how they're really passionate about the education. And we met, um, for instance, another um, physician who had switched over to be more research based and she kind of talked with us about why she made that transition because she felt like she could actually make a bigger impact in that role than she was making as a clinician. And so I, I found that part of it really refreshing um, and a very different than the bias that I had going into it. Tanya, do you have any thoughts or Ari or Pal about industry and what, how you think industry could better partner with people, how to stay transparent, any kind of comments about how to improve relations between the industry side and academics? Um, I think yeah. this program is definitely really helpful for that because, um, you know, really training these academic environments, you do have like a more negative view of industry just from things that have happened in the past. But what I appreciated so much from this rotation, which we have said before, is how transparent um, everyone is with their lectures, um, their presentations, their data, which is like the most important part, like where are you getting this data from, how do we know this is safe, and then like actually seeing the numbers in real time, nothing being hidden, the costs not being hidden, being, you know, very transparent about this is what we're doing, this is the product we're making. This is how we made that product, and this is why we know it's safe. And I think that really um, has like really changed my mind about um, industry, and also just being you know more mindful when reach, reading uh, journal articles, you know that are published that are you know negative towards uh, certain things, and wondering where they get that data. I remember um, when we would go through different articles, and then we actually look into the data that they're chiming some of these like references or some of these conclusions and being like, this is actually completely like wrong and bogus and it's very much exaggerated. So lots of eye-opening things I would say. And I think that there definitely is a lot of room to improve the relationship between academics and industry. And it's something I look forward to seeing in my lifetime because I think that industry is actually quite transparent um, from what I've experienced with this rotation. And I think that it's a great avenue for many academic places to you know, be more open-minded to. Yeah, I was actually going to say the same thing. Is, uh, and now it's really surprising for me. Uh, well, not necessarily like surprising, but I just didn't realize how just how transparent it was that, um, you know, Bayer, you can look it up, publishes all their basic science uh, safety evaluations of, you know, the regulatory dossiers they submit. Um, I wouldn't recommend, uh, you know, reading through the hundreds of pages of them, but they're there apparently. Um, and uh, and so being able to, to talk to people and, and uh, kind of see that it's not this kind of opaque uh, organization with, you know, that they all have confidential emails that they're, you know, trying to see what they can do to juke the stats. Um, you know, in, really interesting to learn about how a lot of the um, uh, research are done by third party GLP labs for which, you know, there, there's not even really the opportunity for, to insert a lot of bias there. Um, and so I thought that a lot of that was really interesting to dispel some of the, um, maybe some of the notions that, uh, that have been floating around. I don't have a, a lot to add to what's what's already been said, but in terms of like trying to bridge that gap, I think one of the things that sort of surprised me in this respect was um, kind of things that are similar both between medicine and industry, especially um, this industry, um, when it comes to like trying to, um, fight misinformation, um, based on 
people citing like old abuses of power and uh, mistreatment of, of patients or groups. Um, and so I think that perhaps that's something that would allow more alignment is, is this kind of shared goal of, of fighting, fighting misinformation when it comes to medical science. Yeah, Gilbertson has a question that I think is a really kind of interesting question about risk and how you perceive risk. Um, since this program included a lot of information about agriculture, I have a question about risk versus benefit and how it might differ between human health and agriculture. In human health, it seems like it would be a more straightforward question since the benefit is often to a patient who is already at risk due to a condition or disease. So you get a medication to treat that. For agriculture, the benefit may be more indirect since the benefit may be for the farmer, the environment, but not necessarily the consumer. Do you think this might be affecting how people think about risk? What is your, when you started this rotation, what was your perception about risk in agriculture and how do you think um, the, the, the how do you think we can better communicate the idea uh, about when you've got an indirect benefit about the importance of crop protection and modern agriculture? So I think one of the uh, things that was um, pretty interesting was that because these aren't for crop protection products specifically, because these aren't medications that people are using to treat a disease, um, but rather, if there's some sort of, you know, ad unpredicted toxicity, um, it would be uh, it would be a, a risk in, which might not be perceived, which might be perceived, you know, without necessarily direct benefit. There's really a very low tolerance for um, for any sort of risk, and so it was really interesting for me to see kind of the degrees of um, uh, of testing that that go through to ensure that that, that um, any sort of potential risk is is minimized. When I think of medications, I think of you know we have chapters and chapters of Goldfranks of um, adverse and idiosyncratic events that can happen with even therapeutic or routine use of medications, and we know and we accept these. But for things like crop protection agents um, with routine application, um, there are just orders of uh, safety that are built in in terms of um, you know, m multiplying, uh, you know, or multiplying the, the any sort of perceived risk and making sure that you're far, far below that threshold to ensure that people can safely use these these products if that kind of kind of answers things. Um, and just not, you know, not just even say direct, you know, acute risk, but chronic risk, long term risk with carcinogenicity, endocrine risk you know, um, risk of uh, hypersensitivity, you know, things that might not necessarily even think about. I also think too, when we talk about risk versus benefit in agriculture, um, we had the, the opportunity to watch food evolution and um, parts of this are looking at this at a, a population aspect when we think about agriculture and what GMOs mean to the population. Um, but in that documentary, if you get a chance to look, re, uh, watch it, it also looks at the individual people who are affected by this. And so it looks at how this affects them when they don't have access to pest resistant products. And so how they literally watched their uh, farm disintegrate in front of them and have crops that were completely unusable and how it had huge components of poverty. Um, and so we saw that part of it when they didn't have access to things. And we saw the other part too, when um, farmers had access to these crops and how they were able to send their children to college and their children were able to get out of that cycle for the first time. And so um, I think especially it is, it's a lot easier to think of the indirect risk and benefits when we think about agriculture, um, but there's definite on a person by person basis, you see a huge impact between what resources you have um, and how, things that we think about, for instance, pesticides as being unsafe to have on our crops, 
maybe it's not as unsafe as we think that it is, and maybe there's not as much of a risk. Um, and so I think you could definitely look at it both ways. And I think you can do this with medicine as well too, where you can see the population aspect from the big picture, but you can always narrow it down to the individual who is trying to decide between the four grams of acetaminophen versus eight grams of acetaminophen. Um, and so I, I think if you are given the opportunity, you can see both of those. Um, and it really highlights it here on from the way that they're, um, specialists talk about this in a personal experience standpoint of, you know, I grew up on a farm and these were all of the things that I had to worry about and all my family had to worry about. And this is what it cost for us to maintain this farm versus with having access to these now, that's what that looks like. And so they were able to show that to us on both the population aspect and how this looks for the whole world and what's going to happen in the whole world if we don't adjust some things and bring it also down to individually what that will look like for you um, if these changes are made or if these changes are not made. I don't, that's pretty broad, and so I don't know if that answers your question directly, but um, if not, um, please let us know, and I'm happy to elaborate more or let my other um, colleagues talk a little bit more. Any comments about risk, Sonia or Powell, and how you would communicate, how, how to commu better communicate about risk? Um, I agree with a lot of what, of what Sasha said. I think that um, especially the film food evolution and seeing like what we like to me that was so like in your face and shows you that really looking at the risk benefit like not using crop protection and this is what it leads to famine, you know, um, lack of food for, you know, individuals, a population at whole. And just, you know, kind of, you know, it was said over and over again, like we have a planet of like 7.6 or 8 billion people, you know, and we have to feed all of these people. And how are we going to do that? There are so many natural things that are constantly, you know, attacking crops and degrading them. And so really that small amount of risk, which, you know, is really negligible in the grand scheme of things, you know, allows you know, people to be fed, <laughs> to not go hungry, to not be in poverty. And so I think that film really shows that very well. And I think that that we should have more things like that where we can, you know, easily show people like really the direct effects of risk versus benefit. And this is what happens when you don't use these things. I don't want to repeat too much of, of what's already been been said, but um, kind of like what Ari touched on, I think that I didn't understand kind of the extent to which there was risk and hazard analysis that went into crop protection products. Um, I kind of expected the testing to be much more limited. And so I think the risks are probably less than at least my perceptions were before going through the rotation and seeing that process. So I think that there are probably fewer risks. Inherently, there may be risks that we don't fully understand, but um, in medicine, we kind of deal with both known and unknown risks and kind of a day-to-day -day basis um, when it comes to when we decide to treat versus not and things like antibiotic uh, use and stewardship. And there are some similar parallels as you look at certain crop protection products. Um, and one of my curiosities that was sort of addressed was like monitoring for, for resistance and kind of what, what steps the companies take to try to make sure that we aren't creating like more and more resistant uh, pests and um, and uh, uh I guess pests and um, and plants like uh, uh, plants that are harmful to crops as well. Um, so it was interesting, especially to learn about that in Brazil because they have a 365 day growing season where they rotate crops, um, but they can see really rapid potential resistance among insects because of the rapidity of generations. But it was interesting to learn about the fact that it's something that's being like watched and addressed um, in real time. So Scott Phillips said this is a great opportunity for fellows would like to see something for environmental talks in the future. Can you both or can you all touch on briefly, did we cover any environmental talks? Um, I think we did cover a little bit of environmental talks when I was looking back at my old notes. I kind of mentioned it during my presentations, like how do, you know, the microplastics, like, you know, affect the environment and like those facial scrubs and looking at different excipients and we would look and see, you know, really the detriments to the environment. So I think we actually did cover, you know, a, a little bit of environmental talks with our, um, with all the lectures. Yeah. 
I remember it was pretty neat uh, thinking about kind of what's the, everyone was talking about e fate, like what's the environmental fate of a lot of the crop protection agents that, wine, that uh, are applied. And um, I, I just very vividly remember them talking about how um, not just the, the active ingredient itself, but what are all the metabolites that get generated and are all those metabolites, which can be from photo degradation, which can be from metabolism, all of them are, you know, they determine them via, you know, uh, carbon, uh, you know, by, by essentially like labeled NMR techniques and looking at the toxicity of these these um, metabolites and their putative pathways for formation. And I just kept thinking like, wow, this must be really expensive. And it is, but it's, it's very neat that they, um, that a lot of thought seems to go into that, um, doing things like modeling, you know, where, um, you know, where uh, particular pesticides might end up. And uh, there's, there's a lot of thought that, that goes into it. And certainly not something that we would, you know, see on a day-to-day -day basis in the hospital, but was, was very uh, in engaging. I would say too that this um, this rotation was kind of a it had lots of teasers, um, so we had lots of introductions to a lot of this stuff, and um, I think it's really hard in four weeks to kind of cover everything, but it can give you this broad exposure, and we had the details, um, but it gave you the opportunity for once you realize what was going on to delve a little bit more. Um, so we touched a little bit of kind of the pesticide effects from an occupational standpoint on your farmers and on your pesticide, pesticide sprayers. Um, and so it, it led you to that part and then you could take that further and look up, up a little bit more. Um, it wasn't completely comprehensive, but it, it wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be a introduction to a lot of this. And so I think that that's a lot of where that value is. Um, there is so many parts of toxicology that um, I think that we just don't get as much of an exposure to in fellowship. And so this kind of lets you know where those other parts are so that if you are interested, you can continue to pursue more research in that area or more work in that area. So we've got three minutes left. And as the last question I'm going to ask you is, what was your favorite part of the rotation? You don't have to say my lectures. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, this is the least probably toxicology part, but I like the very beginning when we were uh, kind of introduced to what are the modern agricultural methods that we use in the United States? You know, how does such a tiny proportion of our population feed all of us. Um, and then, you know, all of the other stuff starts to make sense that we do. But um, it was something that I knew very, very little about uh, being, despite moving to, to Arkansas shortly, I'm originally a suburban New Yorker. And so um, not, not a lot of farming happens there. And so that was pretty neat. So Tom Eikoff's Ag 101 talk, is that the one you're talking about? Okay, what about Sonia, Sasha, and Powell? I think my favorite part was how you change the rotation to things that we found interesting. So um, I may steal this a little bit for you, Sonia, so feel free to take it over. But um, Sonia had expressed a lot of early interest in cosmetics. Um, and so um, Liza was able to help navigate the system through some of her networks where she pulled in people to do some lectures that weren't otherwise planned. And so she could really help personalize it to still be within the realm of industry, but really make it individualized. Um, and I, there was so many things that uh, Sonia had so much more knowledge on that I just got to piggyback and listen and get um, a lot of information that was just fascinating. Um, and so I, I think the part that I love the most was how much you could change it to still involve that information, but to make it relevant to each of us individually. Yeah, no, definitely. I just was blown away by some of the lectures and just this, like they said, this de novo interest. I didn't realize there was like a whole field of people working on and just getting the chance to like meet all these interesting people that know so much about, yeah, cosmetics, consumer health products, and, you know, just like your mentorship also, Liza, like just being so open to like our interests and really just like pushing us to continue to follow those interests. I just, it was just such a great experience. I was just completely blown away. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll second what 
what Ari said, like I was, I really enjoyed the agriculture portion of this just because growing up in suburban or not even urban Massachusetts, I um, also had very limited exposure to farming and I was curious about kind of how things work. I think a lot of us in toxicology are sort of nuts and bolts and how things work kind of people. And so this is an opportunity to, to see that both on the actual practical side as well as the, the science side of things. Um, and I think just to add something a little bit different that I really enjoyed and was was nice to see. I don't know if this was true for everybody else as well, but uh, a number of the scientists tagged along to different talks um, across. So people from crop sciences showed up in talks for like consumer health and stuff like that. And so it was kind of exciting to like learn alongside other scientists as well. Well, good. That brings us to the hour. And um, thank you all very much for your attention. And it, once again, it was wonderful to have all four of you on our rotation. And we're looking forward to the, having the next cohort come join us. Um, we'll definitely be in touch. Um, I hope to collaborate with all of you on different projects um, and help uh, help your launch your early careers. And so please feel free to reach out to uh, any or all of us um, at any time. Um, and good luck going forward. And um, thanks very much for participating in the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very much.